Matthew chapter 27. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed, and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces, and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel, and bought with them the potter's field, to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner, whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Then answered all the people, and said, His blood be on us, and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall, and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him, and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him, and took the reed, and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on his right hand and another on the left one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. 
Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge, and filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea, named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher, and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary, sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day, that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulcher, sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Matthew chapter 27 begins with the chief priests and all the elders forming a council to put Jesus to death. And they've been planning this for a long time. It's just now that it's actually time and they have Jesus. He has been betrayed by Judas. And interestingly enough, Judas actually repents and he returns the silver and it says that he repents. But then immediately after he goes and hangs himself. And in my opinion, suicide is a sin, it's murder, and suicide is, is indeed murder, in my opinion, and that's one of the biggest sins. Thou shalt not kill, and that certainly includes yourself. So I think it's pretty clear that Judas does end up not being saved. He does repent for turning Jesus in, but he immediately goes and commits a horrible sin that you can't repent from because then you're dead. And it's interesting to note that in the book of Acts, it's Judas's death is mentioned a little bit different and mentions some sort of disembowelment. And yeah, I'm not sure quite exactly why there's some discrepancy. Maybe both happened. Maybe he was hanged and then later eventually, I, I don't know. But in the book of Acts at the very beginning, in chapter 1, it says that Judas, falling headlong, he bursts asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Personally, I tend to favor the Gospels over Acts, so I would just side with Judas probably hung himself. I don't know if something happened to him later, but I would go with what Matthew says. Either way, I've just, I've seen people discussing whether or not Judas is saved or not, which kind of seems like a strange thing, because it seems really obvious that Judas would, of course, be punished and go to hell. He's the one who turned Jesus in. But at the same time, I, I could see, I mean, he, he played his part in doing God's will, and all of this needed to happen, and he did come and repent, 
But I think the key thing is, is Judas didn't repent and then continue repenting and try to live a better life. He immediately went and committed a horrible sin of suicide and you can't repent after that. So this con the chapter continues with more, more declarations of Jesus as the Messiah. It's almost like at this point, it's just too late to stop any of this. It's like the momentum at this point is such that there's no stopping it. That's just what this, this chapter feels like. There's this huge boulder that's rolling down a hill and that at this point, nothing is stopping it. And there's some instances of people outright declaring that Jesus is the Christ or is the Messiah. And all that can be said is, well, thou sayest, and a lot of Jesus holding his peace against the accusations. And Pontius Pilate and also his wife, it's very interesting the inclusion of t mentioning his wife coming in and saying that she's suffering things in a dream from this. And the the whole act of washing washing hands clean of the situation and, and the way the multitudes say that his blood be on us and on our children. Just very, very powerful few verses. And it reminds me of the way that we are covered. You know how you hear people saying that we're covered by the blood of Jesus? That, I mean, that kind of talk, it always, I'm actually kind of squeamish. I really don't like blood. I, I'm the kind of person, if I start seeing blood, I'll get very lightheaded. I've never actually passed out from it. But all of that stuff honestly grosses me out. But it is, it is important that Jesus did die. He, Jesus was the blood sacrifice that covers us and is makes it able for us to go to heaven. We wouldn't be able to go to heaven. All of us at this point are corrupted and so flawed that we're not going to make it to heaven by ourselves. And that's why we need the blood of Jesus and that blood sacrifice in order to go to heaven. So I, I just think that's interesting because verse 25, there's just that, I feel like there's two ways that you can read it. Of course, his blood be on us. They're saying, well, okay, we're, we're taking responsibility for his death, but then also like the positive side of that in that now we do all have the blood of Jesus in a, a positive way to, to pay for remission of sins for our sins. Jesus is continually mocked and it, it just goes along with the same thing of thou sayest these people, the very people who are condemning Jesus are also admitting that he is king, he is the Messiah. And of course, they're doing it in a mocking way, but that doesn't matter. They're still admitting it. Golgotha or Golgotha, just, it's interesting that goth is part of it, G-O-T-H, a place of a skull. And there's prophecy being fulfilled here about the garments. And if you want to know the source of that, I think it's always good. Go research the source. If somebody mentions prophecy being fulfilled, go figure out what prophecy. It's in Psalms. So Psalm 22, verse 18. They part my garment among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And things like this. It's like the little details that make you appreciate it. All of the puzzle pieces falling into place so that all of these prophecies are fulfilled. Like the fact that Jesus was wearing a garment that couldn't be taken apart. Jesus was wearing a garment that had no seam because that was, there's two things going on. One of his garments was split at the seams and taken apart and distributed that way. But he also was wearing a garment that it was all sewn as one piece. I don't know, knitted or crocheted or something, but something that couldn't be taken apart at the seams. And so that was the one that lots were casted for it. Just so many little details coming into place for prophecy to be fulfilled. It's like, did Jesus knowingly put on, put on a sweater that he knew? Because, I mean, he clearly knew. That it's all those little things. It's interesting. If you've never heard of the sweater curse, that's something to go research. There's some significance to making a sweater for somebody. And Jesus is crucified. And they, again, another example of people admitting the truth. Jesus gets a, a title written. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. 
and there's more mocking and tempting. And I, I think it's interesting that it says that even the two thieves that are on Jesus's left hand and right hand continue to mock Jesus. It's like if there was a time and place that as a thief, you would want to be saved. That was it. They were right next to the Messiah and they continued to mock him instead of trying to be saved. They were in the same position as him and they were looking down on him. Just something about that. Like those two thieves should have been the people in the world sticking up for Jesus more than anyone. They were about to be killed and instead of trying to be saved while they were right next to the Messiah, they just joined the masses. I guess it's worth pointing out that one of the things that Jesus is mocked for, this is probably the most disgusting and clear example of complete hypocrisy of the elders, is when they mock Jesus for have, for trusting in God. They, they're saying, well, why don't you save yourself? And they're tempting. That's a lot of what's going on here is they're, and you're not supposed to tempt, you're not supposed to tempt God. Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And that's a lot of what they're doing is they're tempting him. Oh, you, why don't you prove yourself? You could save yourself if you wanted to. That's the exact thing that Satan did to Jesus when Satan was tempting Jesus and trying to, why don't you throw yourself down from the temple and have the angel save you? It's, it's not us to, to tempt God with things like that, or to try to make God prove himself to us. God doesn't need to prove himself to us. We need to prove ourselves to him. So it's just worth noting that while Jesus is being mocked, the types of things that they're mocking Jesus for should show you the, the character of these individuals. They try to mock Jesus for trusting in God. And then many supernatural events occur at the very end. Matthew, it really seems like Matthew just gets wrapped up really quick in the end. There's three hours of darkness. I mean, I guess we have one more chapter after this, but it's a very short chapter. There's three hours of darkness. The specific words that Jesus screams out are very interesting. The Eli, 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 Lama, Sabachani. It's very interesting. This gets picked up in media all the time. When Jesus gives up the ghost, finally, it says that he cries with a, a loud voice and yields up the ghost and that the veil of the temple is rent in twain. How many, how many movies or things have you seen where there's a character and, and they're about to die or something intense and all of a sudden they open up their mouth and start a powerful voice comes out of their, their mouth and a lot of times there'll be like a pillar of light coming out of their mouth and the earth starts quaking and cracks are forming in the walls. They're just, this is taken straight from the Bible and straight from the story of Jesus. When, so when Jesus yielded up the ghost, the veil of the temple rent in twain. And very interesting that in Matthew and especially the fact that it only gets a few verses, there, this happens a lot of times in the Bible where it's like somebody just quickly talks about something and you're like, wait a minute, can you go into more detail on what you're talking about? Because in verses 52 and 53, it's described basically like a mini resurrection. But I don't want to say resurrection because I don't I don't want to say that they actually were resurrected. Maybe they just saw like Okay, so you just need to read the specific verses and decide for yourself. Because I guess one important thing is that even though even though Matthew is talking about this right right now after talking about the Jesus yielding up the ghost he does specify that this mini raising of bodies happened after Jesus's resurrection so after Jesus's resurrection it says that many of the bodies which slept arose so like I said I don't I'm not going to come out here and say that that was a mini resurrection because I don't want to make a claim that could be totally false because this could be something separate. And it says that they were bodies that were just sleeping, but they arose. That kind of reminds me of the whole meme of burying people that are actually not dead and they're just in a really deep, deep sleep. What if these prophets, they really weren't dead and they were just in this like stasis. God made them appear dead, but they really were just sleeping for a really long time in some sort of stasis. Mm, it's not impossible. Anything's possible. And at the end of this chapter, there's a rich man, a follower of Jesus, and he gives his tomb up to Jesus. And the tomb was hewn out of rock. And just...
very interesting that, yeah, the amount of effort that people went into for tombs back in the day compared to now. And a guard is set, and they seal the stone, and they set a watch. All because, I mean, at this point, they were taking Jesus very seriously at this point. And so they they were watching. They, they knew that he was going to come back in three days. And so that just shows that they really believed him. They, if they didn't believe Jesus, if they didn't really believe Jesus, do you think that they would have been so concerned about setting a watch and sealing the stone in front of the tomb? So they certainly believed him. That's it for this video. God bless everyone.